So, uh, Ronnie, this is the place you are probably thinking of. Uh, mindfulness of breathing is peaceful and sublime. Can you see that? Uh, it's a li li little bit too small. This is the, the Vinaya Pitaka version of the Anapanasati Sutta. So, uh, ah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. You okay, uh, Ronnie? Yeah. Okay, good, yep. So, uh, all right, so let's carry on. So, uh, we're going to look now at the last four steps of the Anapanasati Sutta, and uh, these are often called the, the insight steps uh, four steps that uh, focus on contemplating uh, uh, impermanence, essentially, in other words, the three characteristics of existence, if you like. Uh, so let's see what it has to say about this. So then after you come out of the jhana state, where even if you haven't gone all the way to jhana, whatever, however far you have come, then you can use the insight contemplations that come now. So they practice like this. I'll breathe in observing impermanence. They practice like this. I'll breathe out observing impermanence. They practice like this. I'll breathe in observing fading away here. The practice like this, I'll breathe out, observing fading away. Uh, the practice like this, I'll breathe in, observing cessation. Uh, the practice like this, I'll breathe out, observing cessation. Uh, the practice like this, I'll breathe in, observing letting go. Uh, the practice like this, I'll breathe out, observing letting go. Uh, yeah, so uh, here we have four things. We have impermanence. Uh, we have fading away, we have cessation, and we have letting go. And uh, all of these four things are really about impermanence. Yeah, these are degrees of impermanence. The first one is just anicca, just ordinary impermanence. In, in other words, changeability, that things are changing. The second one, fading away, means that uh, impermanence has a certain direction to it. Uh, the direction of fading away, the direction of becoming less. Yeah, so that's a kind of particular kind of it. It's not just changing up and down, it has a declining effect to it, fading away. Cessation is the uh, final, uh, the kind of highest kind of impermanence. When things disappear completely, that's a very high degree of impermanence. Uh, and the last one, letting go, which is patinisagga in Pali, means that you let it go because it is impermanent. And by letting it go, it then disappears, right? It is no longer a problem for you. Uh, and so it is gone from your mind because you no longer crave and you no longer have any attachment to it. Uh, so these are the four kinds of contemplation. So the question then arises, what are we contemplating in this way? What is the thing that we are contemplating? It doesn't really say. So what you are contemplating, of course, is the process that you have been through. The main point of that process is the breath meditation itself. Uh, but all the things that are part of that process is what you contemplate now. Huh? And if you think back on that process, depending on how deep you go, you will have seen the changeability of things, how things are moving. Huh? But you're very important, you will have seen the fading away of a large number of things. For example, as you go through this process, the body is fading away, they're becoming less and less prominent. Uh, going into the background uh, until eventually the body ceases completely when you enter a jhana state. Uh, the five senses are gradually becoming weaker and weaker and weaker, they are fading away until eventually they cease when you enter the jhana state. Uh, the will, in other words the stillness is becoming stronger and stronger and because the stillness is becoming stronger, the will or the doing activity of the mind is actually gradually fading away until it ceases when you enter the jhana state. Uh, um, the hindrances of the mind are fading away. The mind is becoming clearer and clearer and more powerful. Uh, certain feelings are fading away. Yeah, the bad feelings are fading away. 
the certain happy feelings are gradually fading away and you are left with bliss uh, at, as you enter the jhanas. You can contemplate the feelings in that way. Uh, perceptions uh, are fading away. Uh, yeah, the whole world is fading away. Uh, the, the perceptions are becoming simpler and simpler. Uh, there's less and less left over. Uh, perceptions are fading away as you go through this uh, until and a large number of perceptions cease until the only perception that is left in the jhana state uh, is a perception of bliss and vitaka vichara. And uh, so in this way you can see how there's a large number of phenomena through this process uh, that are first you can see them as impermanent uh, and then you can see them as fading away uh, yeah, and disappearing. Uh, and uh, eventually as you keep on doing this, the more you see that things completely cease and they come to an end, there comes a point when you realize that these things are not worthy of holding on to anymore. Why? Because when things disappear, you understand things fully. When they are gone, you understand the nature of dukkha, because when they're gone, you feel happy. Yeah, if something is gone and you feel happy without it, well actually it must be dukkha. What you have now is happy. So you understand the body is dukkha, five senses are dukkha, the will is dukkha, etc. etc. So you understand dukkha as you do this. You also understand non-self. So you understand all the three characteristics. And the reason why you understand non-self is that when you enter deep states of samadhi, you no longer have access to these things. You can no longer access the body. And the things that you cannot access, they are by definition non-self. Anything which is self must be accessible. That's kind of the uh, kind of the, because you uh, have to be in control of those things. Uh. So through this process, you are seeing not just impermanence, the full impermanence of cessation, but you also understand dukkha and also non-self. Uh. And for that reason, uh, the very last step then is the letting go, because when you see these things in this way, you understand that they are not really interesting at all. Uh and they become like a hot coal. You're grasping onto hot coals. Why am I grasping hot coal? Let go. Huh? It's, pr it's automatic. You don't have to think that you let, have to let go. It just happens automatically because you understand, you see with insight uh, that you are grasping dukkha, you're grasping suffering. Uh, and that's kind of madness to grasp suffering, so you let it go. Huh? And this is the process of insight. And to some extent, this is uh, a little bit what I'm trying to do at the end of each meditation session yeah, is to kind of uh, contemplate a little bit uh, on how the process works. This is obviously more profound, but by starting uh, to get into the habit of contemplating a little bit, uh, you start to uh, see how this contemplation happens. Yeah? How does the meditation work? Yeah? And then you gradually turn that into understanding the things that are ceasing and disappearing down the track. Yeah? But for this process to be powerful, the meditation has to be quite strong already, otherwise it's not going to have too much effect. Yeah? So it has to be fairly peaceful and calm already for this really to have some... Um, you know, otherwise it's not, not going to, the mind is just going to shrug and, okay, doesn't understand what's happening here. So this is uh, the process of uh, Anapanasati, all the way down to the very end of what is uh, going on what is happening here, here, the last four steps which are all about insight steps. So let's go back to the uh, sutta we originally were on. It's not actually in that booklet because the booklet is missing a large part of this, uh, but uh, yeah. So let's go back to the uh, sutta we were on. So you can see in this sutta, it is all contracted down. Yeah, it's contracted from breathing heavily all the way to letting go. It's, all, it's contracted with three dots. So you don't get to see it. So that's why I went to the other sutta. Okay, so then the Buddha says, that is how the samadhi, due to mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, is very fruitful and very beneficial. Yeah, that is... Uh, the definition of fruitful and beneficial, it takes you basically all the way to the end of the path. Pati nisagga, letting go, is really the end of the path there. Okay. I'm a little bit afraid of going too fast because there's a lot of information here crammed into a short period of time. But uh, the retreat is coming to an end, so we probably have to go fast. 
there's no choice. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Now we come to the reason why I was talk using the sutta. It's for this reason here, because now, before my awakening again. Before my awakening, when I was still unawakened, but intent on awake awakening, uh, I too usually practice this kind of meditation. Usually here, bahulang, bahulam is often. Uh, so I frequently practice this meditation. Yeah. So this is the place in the suttas uh, where the Buddha to be says, or the Buddha says that he also practiced anapanasati uh, to achieve awakening. Yeah. So that's kind of uh, nice. We often hear that, but actually this is the only place in the suttas where it says that. I think specifically. Uh, so this is the practice of the Buddha. Huh? And uh, I think there is something very interesting about the idea of anapanasati that makes it very powerful. Huh? And uh, I think one of the reasons why it is powerful is because that it is a very natural thing. Yeah? It's a naturally occurring phenomenon. Yeah? It is always there, easy to get hold of. Uh, and it's nothing fancy. It is not a lot of imagination. You don't have to create all kind of things in your mind. It's down to earth. It grounds you, brings you back to reality. Uh, some of these meditations that you hear about, they are very fancy kind of meditations. And I think there is a danger with fancy meditations that they can take you astray. They can lead you on the wrong path because you can actually get a little bit deluded when you start imagining all kind of things. Uh, the less you imagine, the more down to earth it is. Uh, the more healthy kind of meditation I think it is. And this is Anapanasati, very down to earth, very healthy, very natural. Uh, and I think this is the power of this particular practice. Uh, and also, of course, the fact that it can take you all the way to awakening, which is really amazing for such a humble thing as the breath. Uh, then he says, uh, the Buddha, he says, and while I was usually practicing this kind of meditation, neither my body nor my eyes became fatigued or strained. So what is this all about? Uh, that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Uh, so what does it mean? My body did not become fatigued. And uh, the, the one way of uh, thinking about the body not becoming fatigued uh, is that he is no longer doing the ascetic practices. Yeah because a very large part of what he was doing before was ascetic practices, uh, and he was uh, uh, calling that, also he called those practices a kind of meditation. It's called the apanaka jhana. Apanaka means non-breathing jhana, and that was because he was holding his breath. Uh, that became the non-breathing meditation. Uh, and that was fatiguing for the body. He exhausted his body because of that. Uh. So that is my preferred understanding of that. The commentary says it has to do more with body contemplation in terms of the uh, four elements, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why that would fatigue the body, but that's kind of the commentarial understanding. Uh. And then you have the idea of my eyes became, did not become fatigued. Uh, so what is that all about? It sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? Uh, what has it got to do with the eyes? Uh, and uh, the, uh, my guess here, and this is confirmed by the commentary, is that this has to do with the Kasinna meditations. Uh. Kasinas mean totalities, and this is where you have a disk of a color disk or a disk of earth or a disk of space or whatever, and you focus your attention on that disk, and then that becomes eventually an image in the mind, that disk, and then it takes you into the jhanas. And this was one of the ways of meditating a panda that existed before the Buddha, and that the Buddha then may have used also as part of his practice. But uh, it has the downside, it says here, that your eyes become fatigued, yeah, because you're staring at this disc all the time. Uh, and after a while, the, your eyes, they rebel, they don't want to stare at this disc anymore. Huh? And they say, we want to rest, please, do mindfulness of breathing. Okay, mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. And this is when, then what the Buddha does, uh, because he wants to uh, spare his eyes from all of this staring at these uh, discs of uh, colors. Uh, Casinas. I think that's probably probably right. It's a little bit strange, right? Because it comes out of the blue like that, uh, and it, the Buddha doesn't really say anywhere that he practices the casinas. But uh, anyway, there you are. Sometimes there are some random things in the suttas, and you're not really sure exactly what is going on. Uh, so um, anyway, let's carry on because I'm not sure how interesting that is, uh, even though it's there. Uh, and my mind was freed from the defilements by not grasping. Yeah? So this is another result of mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? Your eyes are not fatigued, the body is not fatigued, uh, 
And then the mind is freed through non-grasping from the defilements. So that is the uh, kind of the main part of that sutta. And now comes all the benefits that comes from mindfulness of breathing. So the long list of benefits coming up now next. Uh, and we'll have a very quick look at those benefits because uh, they are a little bit interesting. So let's have a quick look at them. Huh? Now a mendicant might wish, uh, may neither my body nor my eyes become fatigued. Uh, and may my mind be freed from the defilements by not grasping it. Uh, so let them closely focus on this immersion or this samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing here. Yeah? yeah, so if you want to have your asavas destroyed, the defilements destroyed, uh, then the way to do it, according to this, is to do mindfulness of breathing here. Yeah? So these are all the benefits that come from mindfulness of breathing. Number one, you become an arahant. That's a pretty good benefit right there. Yeah. <laughs> Now a mendicant might wish, may I give up memories and thoughts of the lay life. Let them focus closely on the samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, so now we're talking about a, um, someone who has gone forth, a bhikkhu, uh, and you want to abandon the memories, the sada sankapa, and intentions based on lay life. Uh, uh, and uh, this is one of the things, you know, some. As a monastic, this is one of the things you have to give up, uh, those memories, because these are the things that can always draw you back again into lay life if you don't actually gradually abandon them. Uh, and these are all kinds of desires and things that, and longings uh, that you may uh, uh, find hard to give up. Uh, and uh, so all of those things are given up through mindfulness of breathing. And again, it's because uh, when you stay with the breath, uh, then you are cutting the ability of the mind to sustain those thoughts uh, and also you are experiencing an, an alternative bliss instead uh, which takes the place of that bliss of the household life. Uh, so sada sankappa of the household life, gehasita is the household life here, uh, are abandoned. So that uh, comes in handy, uh, especially if you are a monastic. I'm not sure if you are a lay person, it might be a bit different. Uh, but uh, when you are on retreat, it comes in handy to do that. Now a mendicant might wish, may I meditate perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive. Let them focus on the samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. So uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, anything in the world can be regarded either as repulsive or unrepulsive. We looked before at the triad, the asada, adinava, and nisarana, which is like the gratification and the, and the um, drawbacks, and then the liberation from things, yeah? And everything in the world can be regarded from those angles of asada, adinava, and nisarana. And the repulsive and the unrepulsive here are similar to that, yeah? The apatikula, repulsive, uh, is similar to the adinava. If you see the drawback and the downside strongly, it leads to patikula, you are repelled by something. Yeah? And the apatikula usually means that you are attracted to something, you're not repelled. Yeah? And so this is the mind of the arahant, or someone who is practicing really well. You can look at anything in the world and you can choose your perception. Do you want to choose to look at the downside or the upside of something? Yeah? And so you can look at the person and you can see something re Impulsive, or you can see something attractive, uh, depending on what you want to look at. Uh, and anything in the world you can see in that way. Uh. You can take a cold shower and you can feel it as delightful or as unpleasant. Uh. Yeah? Uh. And of course, here in Malaysia, cold showers are not really cold. Uh, yeah? <laughs> they are kind of still quite pleasant. Uh. Um, but uh, in some places, you have to kind of hack a hole in the ice to dive in. That's when it's really cold. Yeah? And you, you have to make sure you find that hole again afterwards. You, go under the ice, you have a problem otherwise. Uh, so uh, this happens, right? This is not a joke. If people do that. There's a lake and you want to go bathing in the lake, you hack a hole in the ice and then you kind of dive into the hole. Uh, this is kind of happens in uh, some of these crazy countries where I come from. <laughs> probably in Switzerland as well, people probably do these kind of things uh, sometimes. <laughs> this is the Northern, Europe, Northern European delights. <laughs> The Russians, the Russians are famous for these kind of things. Yeah, Russia is very cold. Uh. 
But anyway, this ability to perceive the world as you like, yeah, shifting, your, shifting your perceptions very, very quickly is what this is about. Uh, and it can be very useful. Uh. Now a mendicant might wish, may I perceive, meditate perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive. Uh. So if something is terrible and something is really awful, uh, you actually don't see the repulsive in it, you actually see it as okay. Uh. Yeah, for example, you might see uh, a corpse, a corpse that is being eaten by maggots. Uh, and this is the thing we see in Bodhinyana Monastery quite often, because you see the kangaroos, uh, they die everywhere, left, right and center, they are dead, dead kangaroos. Uh, there's so many kangaroos in the monastery, that some, they have to die of old age sometimes or whatever. And then the maggots come and they start, and this kind of can be incredibly repulsive, especially the smell is absolutely terrible. Uh, but then the ability to then shift your perception, yeah? Actually, it's a peaceful perception because it counteracts and it desire and delights and this kind of thing. So, then you see the uh, non-repulsive aspect even in something as disgusting as a kangaroo being eaten alive by maggots. Uh, uh, that can also can be also be useful, right? Shifting your perceptions at ease the more profound your meditation is. Uh. A mendicant might wish, may I meditate perceiving the repulsive in the repulsive and the repulsive. Uh. So let them focus closely on the samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. And this just means that sometimes what you're looking at has both aspects at the same time. Yeah. You can overcome both aspects and just see the repulsive. Yeah. Similar one, I think. Uh, may I meditate perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive and the unrepulsive. Uh, use mindfulness of breathing here. Yeah. You can see how you become a master of perception. You can see things exactly the way you like to see them. Uh, very flexible mind. When in Arahant, uh, there are no hindrances in the mind. The hindrances are what make the mind unresponsive, uh, unflexible. Uh, when we have no hindrances, the mind is incredibly flexible. In the suttas, there is a word for this. It's called uh, kamaniya and mudu. Kamaniya means workable. Mudu means soft. Yeah, and uh, pliable is another word for this. Uh, uh, when you come out of the jhana states, the mind is incredibly pliable and workable. You can use it in whatever way you like. Yeah. Uh, it becomes a tool in your hands. Uh, minds are most people because of defilements in the mind. Uh, the mind is often hard and it's not really flexible and doesn't really move, doesn't do what you want it to do. If you tell the mind to watch the breath, the mind doesn't watch the breath. Uh, it goes thinking about dinner or something instead. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, this is the mind which is not pliable, it is not workable. You don't have control over your mind. The mind just does its own thing. Yeah? So having control of the mind is kind of nice. Yeah, Watch the breath, okay. Like a nice dog, watching the breath, watching the breath, right? Uh, following along. Yeah? You want to have a mind like a dog. Yeah? yeah, Do this, okay dog, get the bone. Dog, duk, 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 gets the bone. Yeah, You are very happy. Yeah? This is kind of the ideal mind, does exactly what you want it to do. Yeah? All right. Now a mendicant might wish, may I meditate staying equanimous, mindful and aware, rejecting both the repulsive and the unrepulsive. Uh, the sutta has lots of repulsive and unrepulsive in it. Uh, so you just stay equanimous, yeah? You're mindful and aware. This is kind of the really the higher kind of states. Uh, these are the things where what you really want to do. This is where you're talking about the profound jhana states where everything is equanimous. And uh, equanimity is this idea of looking on. Upeka literally means to look on. So it's a pekati together with upa prefix. It means to look on. And the idea is that when the mind looks on with perfect equanimity, the mind is what they call anenja. It is imperturbable. It means that it cannot be worked up, it cannot be thrown off balance, it cannot be disturbed by anything it sees. It is incredibly powerful. And that is why the fourth jhana is the place where you can have the best insight, because the mind can deal with anything that comes its way. The most difficult things to see are things like non-self, but even non-self can be seen from the vantage point of the fourth jhana, because the mind is perfectly stable and can deal with anything. So upeka is one of these very powerful, high qualities of the mind that we are seeking to establish. Uh, let them focus on samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. Now a mendicant might wish... Okay, so now we're getting into the jhana states next. Uh, 
Okay, let's just uh, take a short meditation break and we can come back to the jhanas. Uh,
Okay, any comments, uh, questions uh, from at the front? Uh, Can I clarify the <coughs> the uh, just one of the stages is uh, uh, breathing in and out, letting uh, sorry freeing the mind. So that's entering the jhana. Uh, okay. So then uh, after that, the process is automatic. Uh, after that, you can't do anything because in the jhana state, you are locked into the state. So the freeing is the last thing you do, and then you enter the jhana. That's the very, very last bit you do as you enter the, the jhana state. Yeah. Okay, and also, yeah. uh, Ajahn, you mentioned that there will be an explosive bliss when entering the jhana, right? Is it like that every time? Like every time you enter the jhana, is it like that? The jhana state is like, it's kind of a standard, it's the same state pretty much every time, yeah? So it is, uh, yeah, it's kind of the, be, be the most powerful bliss you have ever experienced, but you're building it up, building it up, building it up, and then you enter the jhana, it's like the culmination of that building up, yeah, when you get there. Always be the same, yeah. So can one fall out of the jhana upon entering? Can you fall out of it? Fall out, yeah, fall out, before you, entering properly. Uh, yes, you can, you know, sometimes jhanas, because they are a bit, it can like be a unstable because it is, it can be, maybe you're a bit worried or, or fearful or something, so you kind of go almost in but not quite, and then you kind of fall out again. Uh, that can happen. But usually when you enter a jhana, usually you stay for quite long periods of time, usually, uh, when you enter it properly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ajay. Yeah. I don't understand. Uh, you see, some years back, I was in a Vipassana retreat. Yeah. After two days or so, everybody has aches and pains all over. Yeah. Not, not, not necessarily from posture. So, yeah. and then, uh, I also have aches and pain. Then, some time later, I was doing meditation uh, with Meta. Yeah. At, at that time, I was having shoulder ache due to exercise. Surprisingly, so only after 15 minutes of Meta, the aches are gone. How come one meditation bring out eggs, another one suppress eggs. Uh. How come one teaching that you, you should go in with Vipassana, the eggs? In yeah, yeah. the eggs and pins arises. Yeah, yeah. The, in Metta, the eggs and pins are gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's because you are, uh, you know, the, the it, it can be many reasons for that, uh, but, uh, you know, because Vipassana is often going to the feelings in the body, you're deliberately focusing on the feelings, so you will feel it very prominently. Uh, but when you're doing metta, you're focusing on something else, you're focusing on the, the positive feelings. Uh, and because you're pos focusing on the positive feelings, the negative feelings tend to disappear. Uh, yeah, so it really it depends on what you're focusing. It's the same thing here with the breath. If When this breath meditation becomes very profound, uh, you can't really feel the body anymore. Uh, Yes, that's why the aches and pains are gone, because the body fades into the background. Uh, and with the metta, with any kind of deep meditation, the body tends to feel really at ease and really relaxed. Uh, this is the beauty of this thing. So the, it actually is not only that uh, uh, you're suppressing the feelings, but actually the feelings dissolve somehow through the power of the mind. And then they're no longer there. Uh, so when you come out afterwards of the metta or the samadhi, actually the body is really relaxed and really at ease. There's no pains anymore. Uh, so it is all this focusing on it, which is the, the pain, which is the, the problem sometimes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ajahn? Uh, here. Where? I'm here. There, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ajahn, just now yeah. when you mentioned the 16 yeah. stages of Anapanasati, mm. uh, because the text we have here is not in sequence, so may I know when you look at the screen, which sutta you are referring to? I'm, I'm so looking at Magic Marika 118. Oh, okay. This one here. This is where it has all the, all the stages. This is what? the, this is the standard. This is the Anapanasati Sutta. Yeah, the main one. MN 118. Yeah. 118. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Mindfulness of breathing. There you are. Ah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Uh, Viraga Nupasi. In the in the fourth tetrad, Viraganupasi. What is the literal meaning of of Viraga? 
here it is translated as fading away. Could there be a, uh, what is the literal meaning? Uh, Raga has two meanings. Uh, one is the opposite of Raga, and Raga is uh, like desire. Uh, so Viraga is very often translated as dispassion. Uh, dispassion meaning non-desire is a very common translation for Viraga. But Viraga ha also has the meaning of fading away. Both of those are, are, are literal meanings of the word Viraga has both of those meanings. Uh, so the context decides which one is the uh, uh, right meaning. Uh, so here, because we're talking about impermanence, it is uh, uh, fading away. It seems to be the right uh, right meaning in this context. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, we what uh, viraga uh, yeah. this passion could be could be understood as a result of uh, of understanding of of seeing impermanence right yeah so it, it, it could i mean you could argue that uh, this passion also fits the context reasonably well it can be used as well uh, in the sense that when you feel dispassionate towards something it because fading away and dispassion are also closely related right because when you are dispassionate things fade away and when they fade away well it's usually because you're because of these passions, they obviously are linked to each other in a certain way. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, yeah. I have this problem when I meditate, right? When I try to tend to too relax, too calm. Yeah. Because I have this sleep apnea problem. Okay. So, basically, there's a moment that I don't breathe. Uh -huh. So, and then I come, I take a deep breath again. Yeah. Then it sounds like, Everything starts to come back all of a sudden, and then you start to start from all over again. Uh, okay. Yeah. How do I overcome this? Don't know. <laughs> 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 maybe do it. Maybe do some other meditation. Do do some meta meta meditation or something instead. You know, uh, because if the breath is a problem, it might be better to do some other meditation. Uh, try meta. Try some guided meta meditation. See if that works. Uh, that can take you very deep as well. If you you know if you can make it actually work for you. Uh, so that, yeah, see how that, see if we can make that work, and next year come back if it doesn't work at all. We talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon, Ajahn. Yes, where are um, you? I'm here. There, yeah, okay. Because yes. okay. <laughs> the loudspeaker is somewhere else, and it, yeah, so I can't, no I have no worries. idea where you are, so okay, <laughs> please go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are two questions. Yeah. Um, one of which is um, when I go into meditation, sometimes I'm unaware whether I'm actually dozing off. Yeah. or I'm actually meditating because ah. I have snippets of moments where um, I lose the, the, the senses yeah. and after which I regain again, I regain those senses again. Mm -hmm. And that's one question. And another one was, um, I, ex I thought I experienced Mimita during um, Ajahn Brahm's retreat last year. Yeah. Um, I was meditating and I started to see bright lights that were moving, that were moving uh, uh, vigorously. Yeah, okay. And um, being very new to it, I started following it, chasing it. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. suddenly yeah. I just felt there is this really um, hot and burning sensation that was um, rising from the back of my neck uh -huh. all the way to the head. And I experienced migraine for two days. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah and okay. that disturbed my yeah. meditation since then. Yeah. Thank you. Can I understand what, what should I do or what, what happened? Okay. Thank yeah. you. So, um, yeah, with, with the first one, uh, you, you just have to, if, if you have doubts of whether you're falling asleep or not, you have to kind of brighten up the mind a little bit, make it more bright. Uh, yeah, there's the kind of brightness and the gladness that is missing in a sense. And uh, when the mind is kind of a little bit uh, kind of neutral, sometimes it can kind of be very, very little distance between mindfulness and kind of being dull and falling asleep. And, the, and that's kind of the problem. So you want to en energize the mind. And the energy comes from happiness and joy here. Uh, so you want to use some of these techniques that we talked about before to bring energy and joy to the mind, yeah, one way or another, yeah, and then you will, you will know that you are awake. The idea is to be as brightly awake as you possibly can. That's powerful mindfulness, yeah, when you when you do that. So try to bring some more joy in, and then keep on experimenting, keep on looking at your meditation. As you do that, you will start to find that balance where it actually works in the right way. So. Um, um, 
it is quite common to fall into this thing they call mitcha samadhi, huh? where you go into some kind of stillness, but actually you have no awareness, and kind of time just goes by and nothing really happens, and it's kind of a waste of time, to be honest. Uh, um, so what, and this other thing about the, the bright lights, and you're following the bright lines, and you have a headache, a migraine for a few days afterwards. Uh, uh, what you have to do is remember that it should all be relaxed, yeah, the meditation. Uh, and probably at that point, your mind was kind of getting really kind of excited and out of control, and then kind of that was kind of part of the problem. Uh, so when the, when the lights are moving, yeah, instead of following the lights, uh, go back to the breath. Uh, and wait till the light stabilizes. It's a stable light that is powerful because it's stability and peace that we're trying to achieve on this thing here. So stay with the breath a little bit longer until you get the nimitta which really is stable. That's the nimitta you want to have. Uh, the moving can be too, uh, is too distracting for the mind. Uh. So, uh, yeah, so basically that's, I think, the answer to, to that question there. Uh, yeah. Hi, Ajahn. Um, I have questions on the equanimous state. Equanimous state, okay. Yeah, yeah. at the last state. Um, how, how does being equanimous sit with this um, rejecting both the repulsive and the unrepulsive? Because rejecting seems to be like very, like, like you need to assert to reject. Uh, let's see what the Pali says, because the Pali usually gives us the clue as to what is going on. So let's have a quick look. Pali, Pali, Pali. Er, okay, so may I, uh, rejecting. So the uh, Pali is abhinivajetva. So I think it probably means something like avoiding, to be honest, uh, rather than rejecting. Uh, so this is the problem with translation. You don't really know exactly what's going on. I think abhinivajetva usually means avoiding. Uh, yeah. So uh, you don't usually have a very strong uh, you don't have a strong sense of rejection, but you just avoid it. In other words, you put your attention somewhere else. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and also uh, coming back to this economic state, I think four four steps before, you did mention something about darling of the mind. So, how what what is the difference between that dull mind and the economist? You know what I mean. Uh, the difference is enormous because when you are economist in this way, you are very, very sharp. You know, the mindfulness, it, this is actually the highest kind of mindfulness you can have. Uh, mindfulness is super strong. You're going through the jhanas, right? Uh, one, one after the other, we come to that now. And this is really the equ kind of equanimity that is based on the third or the fourth jhana state. Uh, the mind is going to be very, very powerful, very clear, lots of energy in the mind, uh, but an equanimous kind of energy uh, rather than the energy which is blissful. Uh, Okay, so the earlier stage where there is a darling of the mind, mm. it is a necessary step. I, is that what, what it means? Uh, no, I, you, you want to avoid the dullness. Yeah, so dullness is to be avoided. Yeah. But uh, it, it is something most people will go through because it's a very common thing to have a dullness. So it's something you have to learn to deal with. Yeah. So it's not necessary, but it, you have to learn to deal with it usually. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's carry on a little bit. Uh, so we are coming towards the end of this. Uh, so now we come into the jhana states, and they're kind of interesting here. Uh, so now a mendicant might wish, uh, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, uh, secluded from unwholesome qualities, uh, may I enter and remain in the first absorption, the first jhana, which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion while placing the mind and keeping it connected. Uh, so this is the first jhana, this is what you enter as you are freeing the mind uh, towards this twelfth, after the twelfth step of the Anapanasati Sutta. And again, you will see here, it's quite secluded from the five senses. You know, the kamehi, the plural over there, means the five senses. Uh, and then you have the unskillful qualities, these are the five hindrances, uh, which includes sensual uh, desire, uh, yeah, which is completely gone at this point. Uh, uh, entering the first absorption, which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion. Uh, so, uh, the point here is that as you go through the meditation, you go through a large number of degrees of bliss and happiness. Yeah? We have seen this in the Anapanasati Sutta, where you have one bliss and then a higher bliss and then even more bliss one after the other. 
But then when you enter the first jhana, it's an even a new bliss again, even more powerful. And the name of this bliss is rapture and bliss, born of seclusion. Uh, uh, that's the name of this kind of bliss, uh, vivekaja piti sukha, born of seclusion, because it's born of the seclusion from the five senses and the five hindrances. You are secluded from these things, uh, yeah? it's as, as it says at the beginning of that formula. So this is the, literally the name of the bliss, and it is a very, very high and advanced kind of bliss uh, that you go through, you get to at this point. Uh, and then you have this idea of while placing the mind and keeping it connected. This is vitaka vichara, savitaka savichara you have up here. Yeah, and uh, so this is then the last remnant of the movement of the mind, the wobble of the mind, uh, before this is given up completely in the second jhana. Because it ends in the second jhana, it means the first jhana is the most refined kind of vitaka vichara that is possible to have. Uh, yeah, because it ends in the next jhana, this must be the most refined kind. And the most refined kind of these things is not thinking in any ordinary sense. It is just this wobble or slight movement of the mind, which is the precursor or the necessary cause of all thinking. Uh, that is, uh, you know, you can't think without movement of the mind. Thinking by definition is movement of the mind. So that is the first jhana. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly, so please feel free to ask questions. You can write them down, we can take them later on now. Let them focus on mindfulness of samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing, yeah, if you want the first jhana. Now if you wish, as the placing of the mind and keeping it connected are stilled, may I enter and remain in the second jhana absorption, which has the rapture and bliss born of samadhi, with internal clarity and confidence and unified mind without placing the mind and keeping it connected. So here the vitaka vichara, yeah, they are calmed. So in other words, they come to a stop. They have the word vipassamade, which means to calm or stop things. So you're stilling the movement of the mind. And because the mind is completely stilled, this is called absolute samadhi. This is why this is called samadhija piti sukha down here. The piti sukha born of samadhi. The full samadhi means the mind is no longer moving. It is fully unified fully stilled. Yeah? This happens for the first time in the second jhana. And this is why it is called here, it is called ajatang, which means eternally, sampasadnang means confident. So you have internal confidence, and uh, that internal confidence is, uh, confident means that um, you, you don't have, the first jhana, because you have the wobble there, it means that you're not confident in the object, the mind doesn't go fully into the object. But when you have the full samadhi, that is just another way of talking about the confidence of the mind entering into the object completely. Yeah, yeah that's why it's called that. Chetaso uh, ekotibhavang means unity of the mind. The mind is completely unified. Uh, and this is kind of the, the weird things about these states is that they are called unification of mind, ekatta, which means the oneness of mind. Uh, it means that there is no duality anymore. It is a non-dual state. Uh, Advayang states, uh, where there is no observer and the object are now unified into one thing. Yeah? There is no distinction between object and observer anymore. There is only one experience, uh, and that is what is the meaning of samadhi. Uh, and this is why these states are so profound, because it feels the whole world is unified. Uh, there is no duality, there is no distinction between you and anything else. Uh, so you have become God, right? Uh, yes, here I am, I am God. Uh, this <laughs> And that's, it's almost like a natural conclusion. If you believe in God, it is a natural conclusion to draw that. Uh, uh, because you are already have a predetermined view about what these things would mean. Uh, and so you can't see them clearly. Uh. And this particular happiness is called the uh, rapture and bliss born of samadhi. It's one step beyond the previous one. The one, previous one was born of seclusion. This is born of samadhi even a higher kind of happiness and bliss, yeah? even more powerful than the previous one. Yeah? Now that's the second jhana for you. Yeah? It doesn't stop there. Let them closely focus on this samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? Now a mendicant might wish, uh, with the fading away of rapture, may I enter and remain in the third absorption, yeah? where I will meditate with equanimity, or where I will stay with equanimity, mindful and aware, 
personally experiencing the bliss uh, of which the noble ones declare. Equanimous and mindful, one meditates in bliss. So now the rapture fades away. Yeah? You remember the previous one, it had the uh, uh, rapture and bliss born of samadhi. Now the whole rapture disappears, uh, and what is left then is only the happiness part. Uh, so the rapture disappears, when that disappears, uh, um, you have equanimity, uh, mindful and aware, uh, and you are personally experiencing bliss, uh, or directly experiencing bliss. Uh, the Pali is kāyena patisang vedayang, sukkang kāyena patisang vedayang, and it is often translated as experiencing bliss with the body, which is completely, completely misleading. Yeah. Because again, this word kāya, especially the instrumental ending ena, the ena ending you have here, I should point it out to you, kāyena, this ena ending, uh, when it's given like this, means an immediate, direct or personal experience of something. Yeah. Why is it called that? Well, the reason it is called that, because you have taken away the rapture, and when the rapture is gone, yeah, the PT is disappeared, the fading away of rapture, you are left with only the bliss. It's the first time in your life you feel bliss without rapture. Personal, direct, immediate experience of bliss. Uh, that is what is going on here. Huh? So, uh, and the Aryans, yeah, the noble ones declare, uh, equanimous and mindful, you meditate in bliss. So before that, this, you're not really blissful, now you're blissful for the first time. Yeah? After experiencing the most bliss you think is possible, you find one higher level of bliss, and then finally the noble ones are satisfied with you. Now you finally experience the real deal. Uh, even though you thought you already couldn't take all the bliss, uh, now you have kind of... Uh, <laughs> so it, again, it's like the Buddha is very understated. Uh, yeah? Now, only now, only this is called bliss when you kind of reach the highest bliss that is possible to experience uh, by a human being. Uh. There is no bliss beyond this. Uh. Next one is the fourth jhana, it's equanimity. Uh. This is the highest bliss that can be experienced by a human being. Uh. <laughs> so third jhana. C amazing path, isn't it? Uh? We've been talking about bliss now, bliss, 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 one after the other, it never seems to stop. Uh. Isn't this kind of a cool path? It's just really attractive. Who doesn't want this? It's like, wow, the Buddha. <laughs> That's kind of how you feel after a while, right? It's just, wow. It's kind of hard to, uh, you can't put words on it after, uh, after a while, because it's just, you, how can you explain, like all of these blisses, one more than the other one? It's almost impossible. You run out of words after a while. Uh, I don't know how the Buddha can explain these things, uh, but it's kind of extraordinary. So that's the third jhana of you, the highest bliss in samsara. So what happens after the highest bliss? The highest bliss is not the highest happiness. <laughs> that's kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? <laughs> there is a higher happiness than bliss. Bliss is just the beginning. Okay, let's go on. So let them focus on the samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. Now a mendicant might wish, with the giving up of pleasure and pain, and the ending of the former happiness and sadness, uh, may I enter and remain in the fourth absorption without pleasure and pain, with pure equanimity and mindfulness. Uh, let them focus on the samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. So, um, um, giving up of pleasure and pain, you may wonder why is that stated? Uh, and the reason why is because sukkha, has not yet been given up. Yeah, the sukkha is still there in the previous one. And sukkha and dukkha, they are like, go together. They are like a pair. So you only fully abandon dukkha when you also abandon sukkha, because they come in a pair. So when sukkha is gone, then the opposite dukkha is also completely abandoned. So you abandon both pain and pleasure completely together. Now you have gone fully beyond that pairing, right? That's kind of the idea here. As long as you're still attached to sukkha, then dukkha is not far away, but when you give up that completely, it's completely gone. The previous abandoning of happiness and sadness, well this was the piti we saw before, the happiness of the mind, and the opposite, when the piti is there, dormanasa, the sadness is not so far away, so that has already been gone. So now all happiness, all suffering 
has been completely transcended and gone there. And that is why the mind is extremely powerful at this point, yeah? Because you have no longer any attachment, any interest in any kind of happiness and, uh, and joy. Yeah? Happiness is now beyond, left behind, now you have pure equanimity. Pure equanimity is a higher kind of pleasure than bliss. C how can you understand that? Impossible to understand without experiencing it. Yeah, it's just impossible. How can you? How can equanimity be a greater pleasure than bliss? Very, very hard to understand. But that is basically what the Buddha is saying. Yeah. So you you just have to do it. You're going to do it. <laughs> You've got to do it after this, right? Uh, so this is kind of the. Uh, this is where we do these kind of things. Uh. So those are the four jhanas. So they are uh, mind-boggling things. Uh. Uh, but it's not the end. Uh, then we carry on. Now a mendicant might wish, uh, going totally beyond the perceptions of form, uh, with the ending of perceptions of impingement, uh, not focusing on perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, uh, may I enter and remain in the dimension of infinite space. Uh, let them focus uh, on the samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. So, uh, going beyond all perceptions of form, yeah, so there is a slight echo of the idea of form is still present in the fourth jhanas, uh, and that echo, and you don't really know what it is, uh, uh, I can't really understand it again uh, without experiencing these things, uh, so I, I don't, uh, I can't, it's very hard to know exactly what that means, uh, but it is an echo leftover of form, yeah, the rupa in those realms. Uh, that is then abandoned completely, so now all the form realm is left behind. Uh, now there's only immaterial ideas left. Uh, ending of the perception of impingement. Uh, yeah, impingement goes with the idea of form. Impingement means that something is hitting you, and there's no more of this kind of resistance or hitting uh, at all. Uh, that comes with the idea of form. Again, I must admit I'm not entirely sure how to understand this, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's there. So. Uh, not focusing on perceptions of diversity, the mind again being very completely unified, uh, all of these things have been given up, uh, and you are, all you are aware of uh, is the idea that space is without limits. Uh, unlimited, unbounded space uh, is what this is about. Yeah? Uh, not, I'm not sure if I like the translation infinite, because infinite gives the idea that something goes on forever. It is more like it has no bounds, there is no particular limit. Yeah? If you try to find the limit, you can't find it. And this is what this really is about. This is the base or the dimension of the space, of infinity of space. So, uh, even more profound than the fourth jhana. Let us carry on. Now mendicant might wish, going totally beyond the dimension of infinite space, where that consciousness is infinite, may I enter and remain in the dimension of infinite consciousness. Uh, let them focus on the breath. Uh, yeah, so now it is not space that goes on forever, potentially, it is consciousness that has no bounds. Uh, what is the difference between boundless consciousness and boundless space? Uh, how, how are these experienced differently? Uh, I don't know. So just going to carry on. <laughs> Going totally beyond the dimension of uh, uh, infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing at all, uh, may I enter and remain in the dimension of nothingness. Uh, let them closely focus on the samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. Uh, so here you are aware that there is nothing. Uh, so what does that mean, to be aware that there is nothing? Uh, how, does that, how is that different from actual nothing? Uh, so there is some kind of awareness. It is not infinite consciousness, it is not infinite space, it is just awareness of nothing. Yeah. It's kind of mysterious, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, and then comes even more mysterious things. Uh, might, a mendicant might wish, going totally beyond the dimension of nothingness, may I enter and remain in the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. Let them focus on the mindfulness of breathing here. Yeah. So you perceive that there is neither perception nor non-perception here. Okay, I'll, I'll not even attempt to comment on that. I'll just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
now a mendicant might wish, going totally beyond the dimension of neither perception or non-perception, may I enter and remain in the cessation of perception and feeling here. Yeah? yeah, let them closely focus on the mindfulness of breathing here. Yeah. So this one is a little bit easier to comment on because it's a bit more obvious what it means. Uh, and uh, here everything comes to an end uh, because perception and feeling, uh, when they end, consciousness itself ends. The mind comes to an end. Uh, yeah? And when the mind comes to an end, uh, this is the highest kind of uh, uh, tranquility, if you like, that is achievable. Uh, and when you come out of this particular state, this is where you are going to be the most peaceful you have ever been because of the complete ending of things. Uh, uh, so you enter the state and because of uh, past momentum or whatever, uh, eventually the momentum of peace stops and then the mind re-emerges again. Consciousness comes back as a consequence uh, because the momentum of peace has a certain ending to it. Uh, it's, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? Everything, everything can stop. It's kind of remarkable. Uh, nothing is left. The mind has temporarily, temporarily suspended uh, Okay, there's still more to go here. When, Im when immersion due to mindfulness and breathing has been developed and cultivated in this way, if they feel a pleasant feeling, they understand that it is impermanent uh, and they are not attached to, to it uh, and they don't take pleasure in it. So now we are back to the Arahant. Yeah? So he may, you may have gone through all of these things or you may not, uh, but you are an Arahant. This was kind of one of the main purposes of the Anapanasati uh, um, practice was to become an Arahant. And this is how the Arahant experiences the feelings. Yeah? They um, know that there is a pleasant feeling and they, regardless of what that pleasant feeling is, even if it is one of the highest jhana states, uh, they know it is impermanent uh, so you don't attach to these things. Uh. And this is very hard not to attach to these things because if you experience the greatest bliss you have ever experienced, the natural inclination of the mind is to attach. But if you understand that it is impermanent, you know attachment is going to lead to dukkha and so you don't attach. This is kind of the power of the arahant. They don't take pleasure in it. And if they feel a painful feeling, they understand that that too is impermanent, that they're not attached to it and that they don't take pleasure in it. If they feel a neutral feeling, even the higher fourth jhana and beyond, they understand that it is impermanent, that they're not attached to it, and that they don't take pleasure in it. Yeah, so even the very highest feelings that are available, you don't take pleasure in any of these things, because you know the moment you do that, you have a problem. If they feel a pleasant feeling, they feel it detached. If they feel a painful feeling, they feel it detached. If they feel a neutral feeling, they feel it detached. You just know it is there, you don't take it as yours. It is just nature taking its course. You see your own five khandas as nature, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, It's no different from just nature doing stuff. You don't take it as yours anymore. Just like this table isn't yours, the body and the five khandas are not yours. Feeling the end of the body approaching, they understand. I feel the end of the body approaching. Yeah, yeah? end of body, yeah, okay, end of body. Yeah, Arahant is not kind of probably happy, yeah, it kind of is like the workmen waiting for the wages. They're really happy to, the wages are coming, yay, the end of the body. Yeah. Feeling the end of life approaching, they understand. I feel the end of life approaching. Hooray, end of life. Yeah. They understand, when my body breaks up and my life has come to an end, everything that is felt, since I no longer take pleasure in it, will become cool right there or right here. Yeah, so when you, everything becomes cool right here, in other words, everything just ends, everything becomes cool, there's nothing more to take pleasure in, everything stops at that particular point. This is why this, I said the sutta is quite profound, right? Uh, and uh, it really goes to a long, deep way to some of the deepest aspect of the Dhamma. Everything becomes cool. Suppose an oil lamp depended on oil and a wick to burn. 
as the oil and the wick are used up, it would be extinguished due to lack of fuel. Yeah, extinguishment, yeah, nibap, nibayaya, see the word over here, this is the same word as nibbana, this is why nibbana is extinguishment, uh, yeah, this is the verbal form, form, yeah, so it is extinguished, uh, so this is why extinguishment is the right translation for nibbana, by the way, you can see that now, uh, so that oil and lamp depends on fuel, uh, yeah, and if when it is all used up, it is extinguished due to lack of fuel, in the same way, Feeling the end of the body approaching, they understand. I feel the end of the body approaching. Yeah. Feeling the end of life approaching, they understand. I feel the end of life approaching. Yeah, yeah the, um, the fuel is coming to an end. There's a remnant of the fuel. There's a rem it's just the body carrying on uh, until you die. Yeah. And because there is no more fuel to add, there's no craving that adds to this fuel, uh, then of course everything comes to an end as a consequence. Uh. They understand, when my, my, when my body breaks up and my life has come to an end, uh, everything that's felt, since I no longer take pleasure in it, uh, will become cool right here. You're going to be, be a cool, you are a cool one. Uh, that is what is happening here. Uh. So uh, this is one of my kind of nice names that I would like to have for one of our monks in the monastery, uh, Siti Bhutto, which means the cool one. Uh. And, <laughs> And that was a nice name for a monastic, I think, yeah. So you, uh, you can have the higher kind of cool, uh, not the lower kind of cool. Uh. So anyway, I, I don't know, I'm not going to comment much more on that, I'll leave it at that. Uh, let's do a little bit of uh, meditation again here. Uh.
Okay. So, any questions on this? Okay, that's good. Sometimes the text is so difficult, you don't even know what to ask, because it's just, I have no idea where to start. But <laughs> I've got too many questions, Ajahn. <laughs> okay, go for it. Okay, that's good. Um, the first one. Um, yeah. can, does it make sense to relate the different steps to the four stages of enlightenment? To, to, to relate which one to the four stages of enlightenment? Yeah. Perhaps the progress of the cultivation with uh, a stream enterer versus yeah. a Sakadagami. You mean the progress we have seen here? It's difficult to relate because uh, this is just a different way of expressing it. Uh, so, But you can be sure that through this process somewhere these things will happen. So the stream entry might typically happen maybe around the first or second jhana. Uh, yeah? And then uh, the deeper anagami may happen after maybe the third jhana or something like that. And maybe after the fourth. Uh, so roughly like that. Uh, the deeper the jhana, the more power it has to take you all the way to awakening here. Yeah. So uh, that would be my brief answer to that one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. because I, I see it, it's a progression. Um, even if we have a glimpse of the first or the second jhana, yeah. it doesn't just happen like one, two, three, four, five, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, so sometimes you need to attain jhanas a few times before you even get to, to stream entry, right? Because it's, uh, you need to get used to the idea, used to the feeling, contemplate it properly, and all these kind of things. Uh, so it's not, it's not automatic, these things. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Also, um, when we say that the 16 steps of Anapanasati fulfills the four Satipatthana, yeah. then how would you define Satipatthana, Sati and Upatthana? How do you define it? I would define as the focuses of mindfulness. Yeah, so or, or the application application of mindfulness. How to apply mindfulness. It is sometimes it is translated as the establishings of mindfulness. Uh, the, the traditional translation is the foundations of mindfulness, which I think is really a bad translation because that implies that it, it, it is what creates mindfulness, if it is the foundation of our But the purpose of the meditation is not to create mindfulness, but to use mindfulness uh, f towards, the, towards the object. Uh, and that's why I call it the application of mindfulness, because you are applying mindfulness to the object. You are using mindfulness. You are focusing mindfulness on an object. Uh, that's why I would say application of mindfulness to me is a good translation. Uh, yeah, so sim a little bit similar to establishing a mindfulness, uh, to establish it on, on the object. Uh, so give rise to mindfulness, mm -hmm. then you use it to uh, attain samadhi. That's kind of the idea. Yeah. You know, one of those uh, say, uh, Mahasi. <coughs> Mahasi Sayadaw follow a Thai monk, and uh, I went to the retreat center. This what they teach the Mahasi yeah. technique, and I went for an interview. And uh, uh, I told him I've been doing anapanasti, and uh, he he said that uh, you know this anapanasti. Uh, very few teacher could explain all the sixteen steps, uh -huh. and you know what we had here. So that maybe that, that's why they don't think that it's uh, you know hmm. it's a tech, good technique or whatever. Okay. <laughs> so they teaching Mahasi. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So that probably means they haven't got so much experience with uh, samadhi and uh, the samatha. Is probably what it means. Uh, yeah. uh. Mm. Okay. Thank you for that comment. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Ajahn, yeah. Uh, can I clarify? So um, af when af after entering the jhanas, the yeah. object is no longer the the breathing mindfulness yeah. of breathing, but yeah. this sutta kept. You know, on every level, he kept mentioning the uh, close, cr yeah, um, focus on this yeah. immersion due to mindfulness of yeah. breathing. Can you please clarify? Thank yeah. you. So the, the, this, this is what I mean, is that the jhanas come, you, the twelfth step is freeing the mind. That's the last thing you do before you enter the jhana. Yeah. So the jhanas are not really inside the Anapanasati Sutta. 
it is implied by the sutta because you're doing the last thing that you do to enter. Uh, so as you approach the jhana, the breath is getting more and more faint, but it's still there in the background until the point where you enter the jhana state. Uh, yeah? Once you enter jhana, it's finished. Uh, that's why the jhana is not specifically mentioned in Anapanasati. It's only step number 12 is freeing the mind. That's the last thing you do. Then you enter jhana as a consequence of that. Uh, am I making sense? No? <laughs> I mean, why does this sutta on, uh, you know, like the, um, uh, what do you call that? The levels, mm. in each level, like the infinite space, he still mentioned the mindfulness uh, oh. of breathing and subsequent No, levels. no, that's, I don't think so. Well, it, you, you do mindfulness of breathing to get there. So it is like, it, it doesn't mean that you still have it when you are inside. It just means that this is the practice you do which eventually will lead there. Huh? Yeah? That is different. In the Anapanasata Sutta, it says you breathe in and you experience uh, happiness and bliss. Here it just says that this is the cause for attaining these things. Uh, yeah? So it leads to that. It doesn't mean that you are still doing it when you are in those things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mante, yeah. <coughs> uh, just try to understand the Anapanasati of, <coughs> on meditation. Yeah. Uh, I have to be very careful. I'm trying to quote or to understand from the late Mante Punaji. So the purpose of uh, meditation is basically mental cultivation. Hmm. Uh, basically purify the mind. Hmm. As I understand it, the mind got two parts, citta and manu. The emotional part and the thinking part. Uh -huh. So yeah. the Meditation basically is to try to purify the mind by stealing, stealing or stealing the citta and stealing the manu. Yeah. So as we go through the meditation and progress through it, we reach first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. There's a citta part. So those, when the citta part is still and purify, then we progress to the uh, manu part, uh -huh. the thinking part. Which is the infinite, infinite space and all that. It's a thinking. It's not. It's not thinking. Yeah. It's perceptions. You you perceive these yeah. things. It's like you are just aware that these things are there. Yeah. It's not. It's not actually thinking. It's a perception. It's an awareness in the mind. Yeah. So you just know that it's infinite. It's like, um, you know, it's like. Um, even even if your mind is completely still, nothing you're not thinking anything. You still have awareness. Yeah, something is going on. And so this, these states are the mind is completely peaceful, unified. There's no movement in the mind, but you have the awareness that something is infinite. Okay. There's no thinking there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ajahn, about the uh, foundation of meditation. Yeah. So when the interpretation of foundation, you say is application instead of... Uh, foundation. You, you say that foundation means that it's the creation. But yeah. Yeah. for my space, when I think of foundation, yeah. I think it as a base. Is yeah. that wrong to think of it as a base? It, it base, exactly. So this is the problem, yeah? Because if you say it is the base of mindfulness, uh, it means that it is the thing which leads to mindfulness. Yeah, it, it creates mindfulness. That's why it's called the foundation or the base of mindfulness. But that, that's not how it is used in the suttas. They're used in the sense that mindfulness established first, uh, then you use the mindfulness uh, to achieve samadhi. Yeah, so this is why when we looked at the Anapanasata Sutta, first of all it says, Satting Parimukangopatapetva, having established mindfulness in front or around the face or whatever. Then you start watching the breath. So mindfulness comes first, then you use the mindfulness. That's what I mean. You apply the mindfulness. You apply the mindfulness to the breath. Yeah? That's what I mean by application of mindfulness or the focus of mindfulness. If you translate the foundation of mindfulness, it sounds like you are doing something which will lead to mindfulness. Difference between leading to mindfulness and applying mindfulness. 
make sense or I am I or, uh, sorry please yeah <laughs> please feel free to ask more if, if it's not uh, if no, because when we yeah. use the word apply yeah so I kind of sense that um, you use the four foundation is the body mm. and use the body to apply to for you apply mindfulness. mindfulness to the body or apply mindfulness to the body yeah apply the mindfulness to feeling not, not using the body to to apply to make mindfulness uh, that's what I'm. If you translate it as foundational mindfulness, then you yes, use the body yes, to make yes. mindfulness. Yeah, I can That's see. That's not the point. You don't. Yeah. You're not using the body to make mindfulness. You're using mindfulness to focus on the body. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I got yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Achan, uh, is there any difference between chitta and mano as? Implied by uh, this brother, uh, I it thought it's the same word for a different <laughs> word for the same thing. <laughs> well, I, the answer to that will, will uh, I it depends on how it is used in the suit, as it's used in different ways, uh, and uh, sometimes it is used as synonyms uh, <coughs> because sometimes the Buddha says, "Well, citta, mano, and vinyana are synonyms; they are the same, referring to the same thing, which is basically the mind." <coughs> so it depends in the sutras as they are used in different ways. Uh, but uh, in the, in they tend to have their own sphere that they are used in. So, because the suttas are very, <laughs> because the suttas are very um, structured in a sense, vinyana is tends to be used in a certain way. So the vinyana is used when you have the five khandas, uh, and then vinyana is the knowing aspect of the five khandas, and then you have the other aspect, which are the feeling, the perception, etc. Chitta is used as a global term to mean the mind in general. Uh, yeah, it's a general idea of mind includes all aspects of mind and the correct translation is usually mind. Uh, mano is usually used in connection with the six senses. Uh, when you have the six senses you have the eye, you have the ear, you have the nose etc. and then you have the mind, that's the mano. Uh, it is used in that context. Uh, so it is used as a mind, a separator uh, from the other, of the other senses. Uh, so they have like their own usage. So they are both syn synonyms in certain contexts. Uh, in other contexts, they are used slightly differently. I, I'm not quite used to the way you mentioned it before, about one being the intellect, the other one being the feelings. Uh, uh, I don't know if I... I would have to look in, into it to actually look at that, that kind of distinction. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure if I would agree with that, but I, I, I can't really say without looking it, into it more carefully. So, uh, but that's how I would normally distinguish between the three. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Yeah. Let's have a break. Can we? It's already quarter past uh, four. Let's have half an hour's tea break. <laughs>